This is our last lecture and we'll get to the Temple of Solomon today. And we ended right at the end of section A of the first half of this lecture where it says David as new Moses. It's point nine in your notes. David is presented as a new Moses here because he sets up the temple. God gives him the vision of how it's supposed to look and just like Moses, he writes it down and passes it on. He's the one who establishes the priesthood. He offers sacrifices because we're in an interregnum period here. We don't have a temple operating. If we had looked and Peter had had another week to deal with the ordination rituals, he would have seen that Moses offers all these sacrifices first and sets Aaron up and then Aaron offers the sacrifices. And David and Solomon do something kind of similar to that. They set the priesthood up. Zechariah does the same thing later on. Zechariah is a new Moses. Zechariah's mosaic work takes place in visions, but Joshua the high priest is defiled, the temple is being built, but somebody's got to cleanse the temple and set the whole system up in operation. And Zechariah is a prophet, as Moses was, and as David actually was because of the Psalter and the other stuff he wrote. And Zechariah sees to the cleansing of the high priest and the establishment of the temple when it's rebuilt after the exile. So David is in this position here. He establishes the priesthood, he leads in worship, and he receives the pattern for the temple in 1 Chronicles 28, 11 and 19. And I'd like for us to look there for just a minute because that's important. 1 Chronicles 28, beginning in verse 11. David gave to his son Solomon the plan of the porch, its buildings, its storehouses, its upper rooms, its inner rooms, and the room for the mercy seat. Now, there's something in this verse that's not discussed very much that's important, and that's the term upper room to the temple. I just want to call that to your attention because I'll say something about it later. This has a porch, and then it has buildings and storehouses, upper rooms, inner rooms, room for the mercy seat, or room for the covering, the cherubim covering, and the plan of all that he had in mind, now in the margin it says, all that he had the Spirit with him, in other words, all that the Spirit communicated with him, I think that that's almost certainly the way that's got to be understood, because of what he says later. For the courts of Yahweh's house, for all the surrounding rooms, for the storehouses of God's house, and for the storehouses of the dedicated things, also for divisions of priests. Now there's something new that comes in with the temple as regards the priesthood. Up to this time we've had the high priest. And we've had the priests. Now, we're going to have the high priest and 24 chief priests and the priests. You get to the New Testament, it talks about the chief priests and the elders. The chief priests come into existence here. That's one of the new things in the temple. The 24 chief priests, they're arranged in basically 24 two-week cycles. And each bunch of priests with its chief priest comes to Jerusalem and ministers in the temple for two weeks out of the year. And Zechariah, the father of John the Baptist, was in the course of Abijah. And so he comes up and he has his two weeks. And if we could figure out when that was, we would know when John the Baptist was conceived. And we know how many months later Jesus was conceived. And we know when Jesus was born. But we don't know when the course of Abijah was, so we don't know the answer to that question. But if anybody ever gets that information, then you could figure out roughly when Jesus was born. At any rate, this is set up then. David sets it up. He makes this new ordering of the priesthood that takes place now. Chief priests, as well as high priests and regular priests. This is governmental. We were kind of talking about this in the discussion the other day, that there's this governmental structure in the priesthood. Verse 13 again, David gives Solomon the plan for the divisions of the priests and the Levites, for all the work of service of Yahweh's house and for all the utensils of service in Yahweh's house. Notice the emphasis on service here. It ties in with what Peter was saying a priest does. He serves. He is a household servant. And you see, another thing David does is he reestablishes the Levites. God gave Moses plans for the Levites. It's in, back in Numbers, it says, Numbers chapter 4. I forget whether it's 4 or 2. Let's go ahead and get it right. Or 3. Number 3. I knew it was in there somewhere. Chiastically between... 2 and 4. There's Numbers 3 and 4 describe which groups of Levites do which things. The Merarites, the Gershonites, and the Kohathites. And then the Aaronites. Aaronites are priests, but 
the three groups of Levites have different duties, what they carry, what they're responsible to maintain, and the like. You get to the temple, what does David do? He appoints some of them as gatekeepers, some of them as instrumental musicians, some of them as singers, and as the Chronicles lists out all these people in their courses uh, in chapter 23, the Levite genealogy is given in chapter 24, the courses of the Levites, 24 bunches of Levites divided up into various groups of responsibilities. In chapter 25, all the 24 courses of Levites who dealt with singing. In chapter 26, the Levites who dealt with keeping the gate. In chapter 26, the Levites who were in charge of the treasures. So that's all laid out there. David does that. He's making the human temple as well as getting the plan for the physical temple. Verse 14, David gave to Solomon the plan for the golden things, the weight of gold for all the utensils of every kind of service. The word utensil is kali. You study that word out and it refers to people. We're utensils. Some of us, Paul says, are clay pots that aren't useful for much. Others are golden pots that are used for better things. But all these utensils in the tabernacle and the temple, if you studied them and said, some of the t utensils were bowls, some were snuffers, some were trimmers. But they're all pictures of things that we're supposed to do. One way or another, as we relate to one another as a nation of priests, we should help trim each other's lamps. We should help serve each other bread. We should help pray for each other in incense. Whatever. Some of it would become rather difficult to understand the symbolism, but the utensils represent the people. And at the end of Kings, that becomes important. Maybe we'll have the time to point that out. There's golden utensils in verse 14, and there's silver utensils. Now, there's not much about what the silver is used for except in this passage, but we have gold and we have silver. And remember that in the tabernacle, there is, so to speak, a silver floor between the courtyard of bronze and the golden things that are in the holy place and the temple. In other words, you've got this golden lampstand. Remember how we had the sockets of bronze and then the bands of silver at the top and the sockets of silver stacked on top? Well, that's replicated out in the temple in a larger way with a whole lot of silver things, as we'll see in just a moment. So take note of the silver utensils. Verse 15 says, David gave to Solomon the weight of gold for golden lampstands, plural, and golden lamps, and the weight of each lampstand and its lamps. So we got more than one lampstand now. And the silver for silver lampstands with the weight of each lampstand and its lamps according to the use of each lampstand. The gold by weight for tables of showbread for each table, and silver for silver tables. And forks and basins and pitchers of pure gold and golden bowls with the weight of each bowl and silver bowls with the weight of each silver bowl. And for the altar of incense is just one of them. Refined gold by weight. And we never had but one altar in each place regardless of how many of the other things we had. The altar of incense refined gold by weight. This is better gold. The altar of incense is a little bit holier so we have this fine gold that's used. And gold for the model of the chariot. That is, the cherubim that spread out wings and covered the Ark of the Covenant of Yahweh. All this, said David, Yahweh made me understand in writing by his hand upon me all the details of this pattern. So now that tells us. Realize that the cherubim are called a chariot here. And the reason for that is the cherubim in the most holy place of the temple, you've got the Ark, then you've got this slab, with the cherub on it and their wings stretched out. And then standing on either side, you have cherub, cherubs with their wings stretched out. Great big ones. They cover it. And God is enthroned here in the midst. You've got four cherubim in here. Two biggies and two little ones with God enthroned in the midst. Now, that's explained in Ezekiel. Ezekiel sees this as a chariot. Four cherubim here like this and four wheels next to each one. And then... Up above these, God is enthroned. This is a chariot at rest. Imagine a chariot. Well, how do you put a chariot at rest? You put it up against the wall. So two wheels are up here and two wheels are down here. Two cherubim are up here, two cherubim are down here, and the seat is in the middle. And this is a chariot at rest in this temple. And the idea is that God moves in and rests. The chariot becomes a throne when it's turned up sideways with cherubim on top and bottom. 
what Ezekiel sees is this chariot has come down and it's starting to move. And so now the cherubs are at the four corners like wheels and God is enthroned in the midst. Do you see that? You have to think visually to understand this, but this is how it's going to look. And it's called a chariot here. And that, of course, in Ezekiel, one picks that up when Ezekiel sees his chariot with these blue wheels and all this other stuff that's going on. Well, I'm going to talk about the silver just for a second because we won't come back to it. Apparently, the temple has a whole porch on it. It's got these pillars, Yachin and Boaz, and it has these outer rooms here. And then out here are these slavers that run down to the altar. And the bronze sea is here out in the courtyard. Inside the temple itself, in the holy place, are ten lampstands of gold and ten tables of gold, probably positioned along the walls like a ladder, and then the altar of incense at the top. So you've got this ladder to heaven motif running through the temple, even though the temple is all on flat ground. There are not any steps leading up into different rooms in Solomon's temple. There are in Ezekiel's temple, but they're not in Solomon's. But the idea is communicated by these chains of things that lead you up. The water of the firmament comes flowing down these labors to the altar and cleanses things. And then the smoke of the altar runs back up through here and it collects, I think, the smoke of the altar as it ascends to God, it collects these lampstands the witness of them. It collects the showbread, which is the bread before God's face. And then it mingles with this incense and collects the prayers, and then it goes up in here before God. It's as if it collects all this stuff rising up. I think that's the image. Well, where are the silver lampstands and tables? Well, I think they're positioned around the temple here, probably to give light at night. And these tables are out here for sacrifices. The outside of the courtyard? They're in the courtyard itself. Okay, okay that, that thing is the uh, yeah, this, outer room. This is a courtyard here, way out here. These are the outer rooms of the temple. Our diagram in your book. But apparently these silver things were on the outside, as it were, between the bronze and the gold, just like in the tabernacle. That's where they're usually drawn, and I think that's correct. So that's where I think the silver things were, probably to give light at night, and as tables for the sheep to be sacrificed on. If you sacrifice a sheep or a goat, you hauled it up off the ground onto a table to slaughter it. You didn't do that with a bull. That's one of the differences. There were these silver tables out there. Maybe wrong, but see, I think that part of what the tabernacle did was had this bronze, silver, gold structure to it stacked up, so to speak, as we saw yesterday. I think it's here again in that around the temple is silver stuff. Then out in the courtyard is bronze, and inside the temple is gold. Uh huh. Is there any connection, maybe negatively, commercially, to the clay, bronze, silver, gold statue of Daniel 2 and 3? I hadn't thought of that, but there very well could be. That you're, you're somehow or other. That statue probably does replicate a holy place, and would then be a negative image of man playing God somehow. Gold, silver, bronze, and clay. That's very easy for me to see. Something else that does, I think more positively, is if you look at the description of the Hagiaris' palace in Esther, it's, it's very much like a temple. It has a throne room, it has outer room, it has a garden off the side, it has a courtyard with elders at the gate. Because the Hagiaris is really being pictured, I believe, as a messianic figure. And so the temple is, is described in very much the same kind of language. Another thing that you see going on, and Peter could have mentioned this but didn't, if the high priest is dressed like the tabernacle, and the tabernacle is the glory cloud as it moves along, then these bells that ring as he moves is the sound of the glory cloud. And see, he's moving along in his own personal cloud with the sound. Well, when Nebuchadnezzar tells people to worship at that statue, and on other occasions he says, whenever you hear the sound of the psaltery and the trumpets, and he lists all these instruments, well, what that is, is the creation of a glory cloud sound that then calls people into the glory cloud through music. The musical instruments in the temple do the same thing. They create the sound of the glory cloud and call people in. The, the prophets marching along with Saul joins, marching along and making these sounds, is a human image of the glory cloud, and he gets into it. So all those things link up. It would also be interesting to know where the fire furnace was relative to that statue. 
Yeah, that's an interesting question too. Uh huh. Uh, Jim, is there any connection between the fact that this is obviously more uh, elaborate? You have additional this one to do in the uh, tabernacle and the progression that God is giving you all for the new covenant? Yeah, yeah, I think each temple is more glorious than one before. Yeah, I'll get to that in just a second. Yeah, it's a good point to make. Obviously, this is a stage of glory beyond. Exactly what does it consist of? Well, the main thing it consists of is the addition of the king in his glory next to God in his glory. The tabernacle was glorious. It was all woven with blue and gold and had these gold cherubim. It was glorious inside there. But there was no external cultural glory in Israel then. The judges had no pomp connected with them. Now we have the coming of the king next to the priest, and there's pomp and ceremony and glory connected with the king. And the glory and the pomp and the ceremony connected with the king is a replica of God's glory, because human beings are the image of God. And as we mature, we're supposed to become more like God, and so we grow in glory. The old man with white hair is a picture of glory. Aaron's rod blooms with white blossoms. Jesus shows up in John 1 with white hair. So we're supposed to become more glorious, and what seems to happen to Israel is, after 500 years, they've matured in glory to the point where they're ready to sit at God's right hand, so to speak, and now we have a king, and the king has a certain glory that replicates God's glory. So the glory of all of this is increased. And just one more image of the glory cloud, we're told that when the kings went from their palace over to the temple to worship and back, these golden shields were taken down and carried by the troops around them. So that as he walked along, there's this shiny thing until Pharaoh Shishak took them away and they were replaced with bronze ones. So the glory was diminished. How's the gold become dim? Well, there it is. In Rehoboam's day, we had bronze ones, but there's still this glory image around the king as he travels over here to worship God. Just as when God shows up, there's greater glory around him. I think that as Protestants, our tendency is to think that God is glorified when we humiliate ourselves. The uglier we make things, the more beautiful God is. That's seen in a lot of our church architecture and other things that the plainer, ugly is not really fair, but the plainer we make things, the more that allows God's glory to be manifest. Well, I don't think that that's really true to the conception in the Scripture, that if a person is sanctified, then when we have glorious and beautiful things, that actually reveals God's glory, and He's pleased with that. And as a civilization matures, if its churches become beautiful, if its civil buildings become beautiful, if its people have beautiful clothes, if they can correct their crooked teeth, if they can make all the things nice in their society and enhance the glory and beauty of their life as a reflection of God, then God is pleased with that. But I think a lot of our traditional piety is that God's glory is revealed when ours is completely eliminated somehow. But that doesn't seem to be the picture here. God's glory is made manifest when his sons and daughters are also glorious, provided that they're holy first. First you've got to have holiness, then you get glory. First you get the tabernacle and you get 500 years of no glory, no musical instruments, no singing in the temple, just an emphasis on the Torah and holiness. And once that's set in mind, then that can mature into holiness. Since I'm on this subject, I think another dimension of the garments of the high priest and in his investiture is that he's cleansed, he gets white garments of holiness, and then he gets these multicolored garments of glory put on top of that. And that's the order. We have to get cleansed of sin, we have to pursue holiness, and then glory comes. It's a great mistake to pursue glory apart from holiness. It's a great mistake to say, gee, I love these beautiful liturgies, and even though this church is liberal, I'm going to go to this beautiful liturgical church because it feels so good. That's idolatry. The beautiful liturgy is nice, I think, but if it's not grounded in biblical inerrancy and holiness, it's counterfeit. And that's the problem with people who get attracted by Eastern Orthodoxy or Roman Catholicism. They're pursuing glory without pursuing holiness first. So there's never any contest between which is more important. But on the other hand, if you do have 
inerrancy of Scripture and you do have your theology right and you are pursuing holiness, then it's entirely appropriate for glory to grow out of that. And I think that's part of what this history is showing us. There comes a time in the development of the kingdom when glory becomes manifest. And as opposed to Mill, I see that fitting in in many different ways. Well, that's the theme of uh, From Glory to Glory, as I would set it out briefly. Let's look at Solomon's building of the temple in 1 Kings. First of all, I think it might be useful just to glance at the structure of Solomon's own reign in 1 Kings. Remember, it's the son who builds the temple, and Solomon is the son. David wasn't much good as a father, and so God becomes Solomon's father, and he's the one who set up as a ruler. Now, the account of Solomon's reign in 1 Kings is structured chiastically. I don't think it's structured by a seven-day pattern, <laughs> but I think there is a chiasm, a little bit larger one than just seven points, and we'll look at it here. The A section in the structure of Solomon's reign is the beginning and establishment of Solomon's reign, which includes the rebellion of Adonijah and the others who rebelled against him and their suppression. And then his reign is established, and that's basically in chapters 1 and 2. We get to the end of chapter 2. Shimei has been dealt with. Joab has been dealt with. Abiathar has been dealt with. The entire Old Covenant is wiped out. And this is just like Jesus. Everybody rebels against him, and they're all wiped out and replaced. Abiathar is taken out and replaced with Zadok. Joab is gone. These were all the people who worked with David. But they just weren't very good people. And David was stuck with them. And now David is gone, and the rest of these people connected with the old preceding covenant are wiped out, and Solomon's kingdom begins to shine forth, and he has new replacements for all of them, new army commander, new high priest. At the end of his reign, if you look at A prime, when Solomon rebels against God, then what God does is he brings many people to rebel against him. Jeroboam, who are all the people that God brings up to rebel against him at the end of his reign? Chapter 11. There's Rezon, the son of Eliada, Jeroboam, the son of Nabat, Hadad, the Edomite, and it seems to me there was more of them than that. And then the prophets raise up Jeroboam, and God splits the kingdom off because of it. So that's Caiaphas' structure here in the way this works. Well, sandwiched in there is B. In chapter 3, verses 1 to 15, we have Solomon and Yahweh, and he meets with Yahweh at the two worship centers, and God promises him a reward. But at the end of Solomon's reign, in chapter 10, verse 14, we have Solomon's rebellion against God. This is the great fall of Solomon in chapter 10, verse 14, where it says, The weight of gold that came into Solomon in one year was 666 talents of gold. That's a huge amount of gold for a nation the size of New Jersey. And kings were forbidden to multiply gold. And then the second law of kingship is the kings were forbidden to multiply horses and to get their horses from Egypt. And Solomon does that. In chapter 10, 26 to 29, he has 1,400 chariots, 12,000 horsemen, and he gets them from Egypt. And the third law of kingship in Deuteronomy 17, he's wrong in Deuteronomy 17, is the king is not allowed to have more than one wife. And of course, chapter 11 Verses 1 to 8 tells us about his wives and his concubines and how they turned his heart away from God and he participated in idolatry in order to please his wives. And so God is angry with him and God announces his punishment of Solomon in chapter 11, verses 9 to 13. And that's parallel to the fourth B section. Well, sandwiched in there are two C sections. The glory of Solomon... Wisdom and wealth, C prime, the glory of Solomon, wealth and wisdom. And the passages are structured. I've given you little outlines of those. Chapter 3, 16 to 28 shows Solomon's wisdom with, of course, the two prostitutes. His rule is discussed in chapter 4, 1 to 6, how he sets up all the different people in his kingdom. Chapter 4, 7 and 19 discusses the tribute that he receives from Israel by reorganizing the kingdom. And chapter 4, verse 20 tells us that Judah and Israel were as numerous as the sand on the seashore in abundance, and they were eating and drinking and rejoicing. So the whole nation goes into kind of a continuous festival time. And that's what goes on in the temple. The temple is in continuous festival time. In a sense, the tabernacle was in continuous Sabbath time 
And in the temple, you almost move forward in glory to where it's just continuous festival time. And whenever we have descriptions of worship in the temple, it's hundreds of lambs and hundreds of bulls being sacrificed. It's a festive atmosphere to the temple that is an enhancement and glorification of the tabernacle. You've got all these musical instruments. You've got all this singing. And so the nation itself is participating in this at that point. Continuous festivity and joy with Solomon as king day after day. In matching that, Solomon is said to rule over other nations. He rules over all the kingdoms from Euphrates to the land of the Philistines and border of Egypt, and they brought tribute. So there's rule over nations as well as rule over Israel, and there's tribute from the nations, which is all listed out here into verses 28, as well as tribute from Israel. But Solomon now is his ruler of Israel and the nations, again, prefiguring Christ. In the church, of course, Israel and the nations are combined. There's no longer any distinction between the two. In the Old Testament, they're laid out side by side. And Solomon, in a type, has dominion over both. And, of course, we see Hiram, king of Tyre, and the queen of Sheba. Both of them want to come to Solomon. Uh, tremendous influence among the Gentiles. And this pericope closes in chapter 4, 29 to 34, by saying that God gave Solomon great wisdom, and he wrote Proverbs. And there were other wise men associated with his court, and he spoke about trees and cedar and hyssop and animals and birds and creeps and fish, and people came from all over the earth to hear his wisdom. So that's that section. And matching that on the other side, after the temple is built, is the wealth and wisdom of Solomon and Sea Prime, the gold of Ophir, the queen of Sheba comes. And we have another two verses about gold and Almud from Ophir, and we have another verse about the queen of Sheba. It seems strange that these are written this way. The author keeps interrupting himself, and yet that's the structure of it. Well, in the middle now, you see, what this does for us is it shows us that God, as he writes this passage, whoever wrote it, maybe Nathan wrote it or somebody the first time, but God ultimately wrote it. God structures this passage so that our attention is focused on the temple. Our attention is focused on the central thing, which is the building of the temple and its consecration. That's at the center. That's what a chiastic structure does. It says, hey, look, look what's most important. In the Jacob story, the center of it is the birth of the seed, the birth of all Jacob's sons, and then on the other side of that, the birth of the miracle son, Joseph. That's how the whole structure works. And in this case, the structure points us into the temple. And out at the end of the structure is that God establishes Solomon's reign and the condition is loyalty to God. And those two things are highlighted. You look at the big picture here. A, God gives you the kingdom. He says you can keep the kingdom if you're loyal to me. And he says you'll be wealthy and wise if you're loyal to me. See how the big section argument goes. And then at the center of all of that wisdom is the temple itself. And then we come back out and Solomon starts to blow it. Well, D and D prime give us moving into the temple and then moving back out. In chapter 5, verse 1 to 18, we find that the godly king of Tyre, Hiram, allies the Tyrians with the temple. Hiram loves David. Hiram is obviously a converted Gentile. Uh, the Tyrians at this time are serving Yahweh. They're allied with Israel, and he wants to build a temple. He can't wait to help out with it. And so the spoils of the Gentiles are going into the temple here just as the spoils of Egypt went into the tabernacle. But this time the Gentiles want to help. Of course, the spoils of the Philistine War are also going into it, but Hiram wants to help. And it's clear from his letters and the way he writes them that he wants to help. The temple is built by Jew and Gentile working hand in hand here in this passage. This becomes important later on in Ezekiel because Ezekiel tells us that the Tyrians were once believers and now they've apostatized. And he talks about how the Tyrians had once recognized the temple and they'd once followed the high priest. Now the high priest is in apostasy and Tyrians are in apostasy. You have this in Ahab's day. Instead of Tyre allying itself with Israel, we have Jezebel. And the word Baal is in her name, Jezebel. She comes in and they follow her. So following apostate Tyrian religion instead of the Tyrians following the true Israelite religion. But that's what's happening here. They're converted at this point. They're helping out. Well, on the other side of it, after Hiram helps build the temple and Solomon gets the temple built, Solomon starts to blow it. He offends Hiram, he offends Israel, and then he offends God. And on the other side of the temple building is his offense against Hiram in chapter 9, verse 10. First he offends the Gentile God-fearers, then he offends the Jewish believers, and finally he offends God. 
chapter 9, verse 10, it came about at the end of 20 years in which Solomon built the two houses, the house of Yahweh and the king's palace. And Hiram, king of Tyre, supplied Solomon with cedar and cypress timber and gold according to whatever he desired. Then King Solomon gave Hiram 20 cities in the land of Galilee. Now, 2 Samuel 24, verse 7 is the cross-reference there. These are almost surely run-down Canaanite cities. And verse 12 says, Hiram came out from Tyre to see the cities that Solomon had given him, and they did not please him. They were not right in his sight. And he said, What kind of cities have you given me, my brother? And so he called them good as nothing from that day on. In fact, Second Chronicles chapter 8, verse 2 says, Hiram gave them back to Solomon and says, I don't want this trash. Now, Solomon had sent to the king 120 talents of gold. That's a huge amount of gold. So he offends Hiram by giving him this thank you that's really an insult. Then he offends the people. This is the account of the forced labor that King Solomon levied to build a house of the Lord, his own house. And those things were fine. The people joyfully volunteered to become part of the forced labor to build a house. We're told that earlier. But Solomon, instead of saying, okay, now the palace is built, the temple's built, There'll be no more corvée labor. You won't have to send your slaves and servants up here one month out of the year to build on it. You won't have to bear the expenses of it. Solomon goes and builds all this other stuff and keeps it up, just like our government. Oh, we got an emergency. we got to have some more taxes to pay for the emergency, but we'll take them off once the emergency is over. You're right. And people get mad about that, and they got mad at Solomon. Remember, it was the forced labor that Solomon kept up year after year to split the kingdom. When Rehoboam became king, the people came and said, Release us from all this forced labor. And Rehoboam said no, so they broke off with him and formed the northern kingdom. So Solomon starts to offend the people at this point. And then, of course, we have a section dealing with his wisdom. He's still wise, but then he offends God and he comes under judgment. In real life, people aren't white and black. Solomon starts to mess up. He doesn't lose all of his wisdom overnight. Queen of Sheba can still come and learn much from him, but eventually he continues on this path until he attains God. Remember David's life. David has a wife. Then David decides to have another wife. Then David decides to have another wife. And after a while, he's got about a dozen wives, and he's used to taking what he wants. So he sees Bathsheba, and he falls into sin with her, and then too late. Solomon does the same thing. Solomon is being arrogant with Hiram. He's being arrogant with the people. And then he decides he can be arrogant with God. And he starts burning incense to Shemosh and Molech in order to please his wives. And God says, well, I was patient while you were drifting into sin, but now, too late. What's the verse in Deuteronomy? That, well, it says, their foot was flat in due time is what I'm thinking about. He, he keeps walking along the edge and eventually you fall off. That's what happens with Solomon. But you, you see the dynamics here. And the other thing I want to point out to you is, as soon as the temple is built, and as soon as it's dedicated, in chapter 9, God appears to Solomon as he had at Gibeon and says, if you'll just stick with the kingdom, I'll establish you, and I'll bless you, but if you don't, I'll destroy this house, and it'll become a heap of ruins. And the next thing is, Solomon starts to blow it, which is what always happens. As soon as the Jews got out there and accepted the Ten Commandments and said, we'll serve the Lord, Moses goes up on the mountain and immediately they build a golden calf. As soon as God put Adam and Eve in the garden, the next day they see the forbidden fruit. As soon as Saul becomes king of Israel, it says he rules two years, and then he starts to blow. That's the way it is. And that's the picture you see. And in David's case, God makes the covenant with David, and immediately after 1 Samuel 7, we just have some intermediate stuff and then David fall. You see it in Nehemiah and Ezra. As soon as the temple is rebuilt and dedicated, the next thing we find is they're marrying all these foreign wives and Ezra has to go pull their hair out and Nehemiah has to yell at them and all the rest. See? That's what we're like. God gives us something and we blow it. So you can preach that. <laughs> but it's here too. Uh-huh. As a practical matter, pastorally, you see this people come in and you know, confess coming for cancer confess you restore them and you know assist them in the steps and you have the righteousness you know I can't the best thing is called the very next day because he appeared to Solomon in a dream and then asked what you want, you know. And Solomon says, I want wisdom. Okay, that happens at Gibeon at the high place where the tabernacle was. And then in verse 15, 
It says, Then Solomon awoke, and behold, it was a dream. And he came to Jerusalem and stood before the Ark of the Covenant of the Master, of Adonai, not of Yahweh now, but the word is Adonai, which means the High King, the Great Master. And that's the emphasis here. Solomon recognizes that Yahweh is the true king, and he's only the subordinate king. So the Ark of the Covenant of the Master, and he burns ascension offerings and peace offerings and made a feast for all of his servants. And so as Solomon begins his reign, he worships in these two places, moving from the holy place to the most holy place and giving this affirmation of the temple as it existed at this time. The temple that consists of praise and psalms and musical instruments and festive enthusiasm. That form of the temple. Now he's ready to build this physical structure. We move to number three. I want to say a few general comments about Solomon's temple. I've studied this on and off for years. There are a lot of little books written on the tabernacle, much of which is not terribly helpful, but there's almost nothing written on the temple. And it's one of the hardest things to study if you want to look at secondary sources because there's just not much on it. But there are a couple of things I want to point out. And first of all, why don't we look in the handout book that you have and just kind of look at some of these diagrams that we stuck in here to give you a general idea. Most of these early ones have to do with the tabernacle. And we come on over past the priest's garments to this page that has some diagrams of the temple on it. And just look at them briefly. Diagram 16.3, it says the temple of Solomon. This is what we're looking at. This is how it would look from the side, the holy place, and then the holy of holies. The holy place was 30 cubits high. The holy of holies was 20 by 20 by 20 cubits, so it formed a cube, which means that there was room for some upper rooms up above it. And this is where I'd like to make a comment on that. There's nothing in the text about any steps that lead up into the holy of holies. Now, if you'll flip a couple of pages over, about three pages, you'll see a very elaborate drawing of the temple and how it looks according to one student's reconstruction. This picture here, a very elaborate picture. And if you'll look on the left-hand side, you'll see two pillars and a giant cherub standing on kind of a platform and then there are stair steps leading up to it, and that's in the most holy place. And the idea here is that you've got stair steps leading up into this holy of holies. And if you look all the way off to the right, you'll see that they have drawn stair steps leading up into the temple itself. Now that's based on Ezekiel's temple. And in Ezekiel's temple, there are stair steps leading up from every level to the one before, because Ezekiel's temple is like a holy mountain. The so Solomon's temple is like a holy mountain, but only symbolically there are no stair steps. Everything is on the same flat level, and the ascension idea is communicated in other ways. And what you have above the Holy of Holies is these upper rooms. And I think that's a model for us, that we go to heaven, we go before the throne of God, and then there are chambers. There are chambers in the highest heaven. Not just chambers out in the holy place, the firmament heaven, and not just chambers out in the courtyard, but there are chambers in the highest heaven. Jesus says, I go to prepare a place for you. In my Father's house are many chambers. I think refers to this. The Father's house is the most holy, and the most holy has got chambers. Got this cherubim chariot here, and on the other side of it, up above, there are chambers. Now, if you look down at the bottom of the page, it says cross-section front view. And what I want you to see there is that the temple is a pyramid. It's a ladder to heaven and it is structured like a pyramid. And the black lines here is the temple. And these little rooms off to the side are not part of the temple. They are very specifically said not to be. In fact, they are built in such a way that they are not attached to the temple at all. If you look, you'll see that this pyramid structure on the temple, there's a ledge at each point that hangs out. The temple is coming down like this. The wall is thicker at each point. And this is the actual wall of the temple itself. In order to build these rooms, you just take your cedar beam and you just lay it flat on this. It's not nailed in. It's not glued on. It is in no way attached to the temple. 
It's very specific in the text that is just laid on here. And of course, it's attached here on the outside, but on the inside, it just rests on this shoulder of the temple. It's going to be 1 Kings chapter 6, 1 to 14. And the second story is the same. The cedar ceiling just rests, lies on this shoulder. I think that these rooms are a picture of Israel leaning on, resting on the Lord. There may be another way of seeing it. They could be wings of the temple somehow attached to the shoulder of the temple because this is called a shoulder. These are never called wings. Of course, in our architecture, we would call them wings. If a building has wings out to the side, you know, you go into this wing or that wing. But this is not actually what it's called in the text any place that I can find. But it does seem to be a picture of Israel gathered around the temple, leaning on the temple, dependent on the temple, ascending up the sides of the temple, but not in the temple. And you can take all these down and you still have the temple. Uh huh. I don't think so. I think there's the walls around the temple that he, that he digs through. It's actually in the walls. You can see the roof is side of walls. Well, what were they doing in these rooms? Do you think about three story then the stairs to go to the top room? Yeah, yeah. If you look at the diagram, it says front view. On the left hand side, you'll see behind the pillar a door. And that's apparently the only door into these rooms. You want to get into these rooms, that's the only door in to go all the way around, and there's a circular staircase right there that takes you up to the other levels. And they must have been used for storage or something. Well, or maybe priests lived there when they were in town for their 24 courses. Is it possible that also that those could be the allusion to John 14 as chambers? These are chambers as well. They're not right over the Holy of Holies, but they're in association with that whole complex. It could be, and it depends on how specific Jesus is being, but they're not in the house. That's what the text is carefully establishing, is that these are not in the house. Now, my guess is that these are apartments that the priests used when they came up to do their priestly duty once a year. Unless you contemplate the house being the entire complex. Yeah, but it's never called that. It's very carefully, the word's carefully reserved for the temple proper. Because in Israel, tabernacle is built, a courtyard to set up around it. And then on these sides here are the Levites and the priests camped around it. My guess is that when the priests and Levites came up to do their annual duties, they stayed in these rooms. There were also other rooms around the courtyard as well. In the temple, you had the temple proper here, and you had these rooms around it. And then you had the, the altar out here. And you had a wall, uh, buildings out here as well that had rooms in them. Now, we're not told this, but if I was going to use sanctified common sense, and two weeks out of the year you have a course of Levites that come in to work for two weeks, and a course of priests that come in two weeks, I'd put the Levites out here in these outer apartments, and I'd put the priests here in these inner apartments. That fits with the symbolic way of thinking. But nowhere are we told that that's what was done. We're just not told. We're just told the rooms were there. And certainly, in an architectural way, this picture's... Since the house is a house for God, these rooms represent God's people gathered around Him. Or to lay another acetate over that, remember the Feast of Tabernacles, all the people came and camped in their own tents around God. And so here are these rooms. Now God is not in a tent, and so we don't gather in tents. God is in a building, and so we gather in apartments in a building around Him. See the parallel? I think we can clearly say that somehow these rooms gathered around, but not inside, represent Israel gathered around God. Uh, the main thing that I was going to with these pictures was to show you that there was no evidence of succession of steps into the holier places of the temple itself. But we should glance at these diagrams as we go. You see in the middle diagram here the porch of the temple, but this is something new. And the pillars, Yachin and Boaz, on either side, and the doorway leading into the side chambers. Uh huh. On the top diagram, the squares and the holy place, are those windows? Pillars? They're windows. Windows? Yes. The holy place has windows in it, probably for the smoke mm. to escape. Light can come in. This is something that the tabernacle 
didn't have any windows, if I was right about the tent being loose around it, it would have had the equivalent place for smoke to escape. There's something more on the whole on arc language. Is yeah, uh, if this is an arc, and it clearly is the next form of the arc, the arc had windows, now the tent will have windows. It's not on the roof, any windows up there? Not that we're told. Turn the page, here's the temple pillar and the bronze ocean. I think the bronze ocean and the temple pillar both replicate the structure of the temple, bronze pillar and the bronze ocean. Peter discussed the pillar, but if you look at the brazen sea, it has lily configuration at the top. It has a double row of gourds around the middle, which is too obvious not to connect to the collar of the holy place. Then there's a bronze shaft and it's mounted on the backs of the bulls that clearly represent Israel. So I think you can see a replication. There's one other thing to say about this, and I discussed this in my paper on chariots of water, but the pillar representing king and priest is essentially masculine, and the labors which we were told back in Exodus are made from women's mirrors are essentially feminine. The labor then with its twelve oxen represents the nation of Israel, and the pillars represent the king and priest, which are the husbands of Israel. And so the husband-wife relationship, I think, is imaged in the pillar and the laver in the courtyard, and that is an image of God's marriage to the people. How did they get into this? They must have had a ladder or something to get up to it. <laughs> the priests wash themselves in there. They wash their hands and feet. You get inside the thing? When you wash your foot, you get in No, I think they, they took water out of it. But somebody must have gone up there with the ladder and the bucket with some of those utensils. Uh, to get water out of it. What, what did they do to prevent the water from becoming stagnant? We're not told. I mean, you know, I've, I've seen books where there's speculation about how they change the water out and all this. But this was not a holy object. The priest could go down inside there and scrub it out. The Levites could probably go inside there and scrub it out. Uh, there's nothing forbidding anybody approaching this. If you look at the next page, it's a little bit more elaborate diagram of the area, just showing the water stands positioned as a ladder between the altar and the vestibule leading in. Just at some point, you may want to glance at those. The next page gives you an elaborate reconstruction of perhaps what the walls look like. That's why I had it here showing the cherubim and the palm trees that are on the walls. We'll see something about them in the text in just a minute. And if you look carefully, you can see these candelabras, five candelabra or lampstands along the floor because there were ten, five on each wall. And then on the left of them, right here, is an altar of incense leading to the veil and into the most holy place which they have raised up. But I would not agree with that. Are these pair of them? Are they... Are these Animal-like creatures and man-like creatures. No one knows, but my guess is that in the Bible they're more man-like than they're usually thought. Both in Isaiah and in Ezekiel, they seem to be much more man-like and going to Egyptian Mesopotamian sources. They're sphinx-like here, see. The assumption is a sphinx is like a cherub that guards the gate into the land. Oedipus has to wrestle with the Sphinx uh, in order to make a passage toward Thebes, so the Sphinx is a cherub. I have no problem with seeing the Sphinx as a pagan memory of the cherubim, but whether the cherub were drawn with lion bodies or not, I don't think so. I think they had man-like bodies and just lion faces. So let's go back to our notes now. Number three, Solomon's Temple versus Ezekiel's number one. Contrary to most pictures, there's no succession of steps into the holier places. Second, there's an emphasis on the golden walls of the temple. We don't have time to do this, of course, but if you just read through 1 Kings 6 and 7 and what is said and what's not said, there's a whole lot of information about the inside of the temple and how it was laid over with cedar and then the cedar was laid over with gold and there were all kinds of things carved on the walls and then the gold was put over that. I don't know if that means that the cedar was completely covered with gold or if gold was inlaid into the decorations in such a way as to enhance them, probably the latter, just considering how art was done. But we're told all kinds of stuff about that. But in Ezekiel, we talk about the temple in Ezekiel, but there's necessarily nothing said about the temple in Ezekiel. We're just told that it was there. The big emphasis in Ezekiel's temple is on the doorways and on the altar. 
And again, I've shut my book, but if you look at the diagram of Ezekiel's temple, you'll see these elaborate doorways. And if you read Ezekiel 40 to the end, big emphasis on doorways leading in, and the absolute center of the complex is the altar. And the altar is given as a holy mountain. It's called the hearth of God. It's called the mountain of God. It's very elaborately described. In 1 Kings 6 and 7, nothing is said about the bronze altar. It's not even mentioned. You have to go over to Chronicles to find the size and dimensions of the bronze altar, and there's just one verse on it. Not much attention is paid to the altar in Solomon's temple. It's there, obviously. Ezekiel's temple, the altar is the center. Tremendous attention is paid to it. Ezekiel's temple, you have a succession of steps into each holier environment, which means that the whole temple area becomes like a holy mountain. You keep getting up higher and higher. It's like kind of a real broad, flat, holy mountain. But if you were to look at it from the side and take all the walls away, you'd see it ascending up to the most holy place and back down. And then the altar out here ascends up too. And that's the big emphasis. Ezekiel's taken to a very high mountain, and that mountain motif is prominent there. And I think there's a reason for that. I think it's because we're in the Restoration Covenant and the nations of the world are pictured as mountains. And so God's true world, much more emphasis is put on the mountain motif. But the temple, that is not what's going on. In Solomon's temple, it's different. See, in Solomon's temple, there's a big emphasis on these pillars, Yashin and Boaz. And you'll see that if you look at the text. And let's discuss that in just a minute. I've discussed it in the paper, but just to reinforce it, in chapter 7, 15 to 22, we have a description of the pillars. And then we have the bronze sea, and we have the labor stands. And then when it's all over again, there's a summary of what Hiram built. And in verses 41 and 42, we have another big description of the pillars. And then everything else is just listed. The same is true in Chronicles. The pillars receive the major attention. Now, if we go over to the end of Kings, when the temple is torn down, in chapter 24, in one of the earlier sieges of Jerusalem, verse 12, or 2 Kings 24, Jehoiachin, king of Judah, went out to king of Babylon. He and his mother and his servants and his captains and the king of Babylon took him captive in the eighth year of his reign. And he carried out all the treasures of the house of the Lord, and what he carried away was all the gold. And he took away, verse 14, all the captains and mighty men and the craftsmen and smiths, and none remained in this area except the poorest people. So the wealthy people, the leaders of society, are made equivalent here symbolically to all the gold stuff that's taken out of the temple. Well, Zedekiah is made king, and he blows it, and so Nebuchadnezzar comes back. And they capture the king, and they kill his two sons before his eyes, and they blind his eyes, and they burn the house of the Lord. And then it talks about carrying away everybody except the absolute poorest of the land. One will be taken and one will be left, says Jesus, and this is what's happening here. Verse 13, Now the bronze pillars that were in the house of the Lord and the stands in the bronze sea that were in the house of the Lord, the Chaldeans broke in pieces and carried the bronze. They took away the pots, shovels, snuffers, spoons, bronze vessels. They took all the bronze away when they took away the middle class. And this is all mentioned. And then in verse 17, the height of one pillar was 18 cubits, and the bronze capital was on it. The height of the capital was three cubits, with a network and pomegranates on the capital all around all of bronze. And the second pillar was like these, with network. We're just giving this description of the pillar again. Big pillar emphasis. Jeremiah does the same thing. Now, why is that? I think the answer is because the pillars are the distinctive, neat, new thing in this temple. Beyond anything else, we had laborers in the tabernacle, we had lampstands, we had altar of incense, and we had general pillars around the court, but we didn't have these two pillars guarding the door. And there are two of them. One represents the king and one represents the priest. I should say one represents the priest and one represents the king. What's new in the covenant at this time is the kingly emphasis. So the pillars are highlighted. And I think the two pillars by the door represent king and priest standing shoulder to shoulder guarding God's holiness. And when they don't do it, then the temple is wrecked. The other thing that I think is true is that the cherubim, when we study the water stands, and I have another paper on this, the water stands have cherubim and they have lions and ox. 
faces looking out. Now, if you know anything about the cherubim in Ezekiel, you know that they have lion, ox, eagle, and human face. So the question is, why don't we have human and eagle faces in Solomon's temple? We only have lion and ox faces. And I think this is redemptive historical. I think that the ox is priest and the lion is king. And at this point in history, we have priest and king, so we have lion and ox. And these water stands that are around there on the panels of them are lion and ox faces looking out guarding the things and only priests are supposed to mess with them because they wash the sacrifices in them so the cherubim have two faces at this point lion face and ox face nothing said about eagle faces or man faces when you get to Ezekiel the eagle face comes into prominence Ezekiel compares Nebuchadnezzar to an eagle because the eagle represents the Gentile world powers and the new covenant comes in and the restoration is one that focuses on the world emperor. Ahasuerus, Cyrus, those are the messiahs, and the attention is given to them, and they are aquiline or eagle. So the aquiline or eagle face comes into prominence then, and all you have left then is the man face, and so where does it come into prominence? Obviously in the new covenant the image of God. We move beyond the animal realm, we move beyond the childhood where we're in the garden with animals, and we move into maturity. And I think that accounts for the way the symbolism builds through the Old Testament by stages. I also think it relates to the four Gospels. I think Mark is ox-like, Matthew is Leonine, Luke is Aquiline, it's written to the Gentiles, and then John is human reveals Jesus as the Son of God, image of God, so man, primarily. But I think that it accounts for this, uh, the way the symbolism is done, partly, partially way to account for it is these two faces of the cherubim. Another thing that is new are not only cherubim carved all over the walls, but palm trees are carved as well because this is the city of palm trees. Jericho is the city of palm trees, we're told in Judges. Jericho is destroyed. This is the true city of palm trees. And the palm trees in the Exodus, Exodus chapter 15, it says they came out and they camped where there were 70 palm trees. The palm trees represent God's people. Jericho is a false city of palm trees that's burned up. Now the true city of palm trees is built. Final observation here by way of preliminaries is the relationship of the temple to the Song of Solomon. I think the Song of Solomon is multidimensional. I don't have any problem saying it related to the love of man and woman in the garden, but it is also a picture of the relationship between the king and Israel. And thus, beyond that, is a relationship, a picture of the relationship of Christ to his church. He uses imagery that we're uncomfortable with because of our culture, but that's our problem. That's not the Bible's problem. But if you look at the way the woman is described in Song of Solomon, it's all this architectural imagery. Garden imagery, she's got all these garden features, wheat fields and deer running around in the paradise of her garden, and then she's got towers and other things uh, featured. And this is the temple. And she has pomegranates. There are pomegranates all over the book. There are lilies all over the book. And these are things that figure prominently in the temple. And Solomon did both of these. And so one of the ways to exegete the temple is to study Song of Solomon. I've never done it in detail, but I'm confident of that. I'm as sure of that as I am that I weigh over 200 pounds. I can't imagine that it's not that way, that there's no relationship because the imagery is so parallel and the theology is so parallel. I think Proverbs does the same thing. As Peter's pointed out, that the wise woman at the end of Proverbs is the ideal woman for the king. And so she is really Israel. She's the bride of Christ. She's Lady Wisdom. She is the same as a Lady Wisdom in the first part of the book. She's described more concretely, but no real woman can do all those things. And so let me absolve you ladies from guilt for not measuring up. That's an ideal picture of what wisdom is incarnate. And the whole first part of Proverbs says the king wants to marry wisdom. And the last chapter says... Mary, wisdom, and there's another picture given of wisdom as a wise woman, but if you look at what she does, she gathers purple, and there's a lot of temple tabernacle stuff there. Again, the kinds of things she does are the things Israel does. I'm not saying that it has no relationship to what a wise woman would do in real life, but I'm saying that the hyperbole and exaggeration in the passage 
is such to point to beyond ordinary daily life to wisdom herself and the church as the bride of Christ. All of us should be like the wise woman in Proverbs because we're all married to Jesus. We're the fit wife for him. So the temple relates there to Proverbs, I think. It relates to the Song of Solomon and the imagery of the temple, especially these pomegranates and flowers. It's another garden. There are flowers all over the walls. Pomegranates, lilies, these things are all found in the books that Solomon himself wrote that it stands to reason are mutually contextualizing. They provide mutual contexts for one another. If you want to understand the Song of Solomon better, study the temple. If you want to understand the temple better, study Song of Solomon. That's the bottom line. Now, the temple itself, we dare not look at in too much detail. But quickly, I have never been able to figure out what accounts for the organization of the material here beyond something that's obvious. And that is, this is how you build the temple. This is the succession of steps you go through. The first thing you do if you want to build a temple is get all your stones together and you build a building out of stones. Now you got a big empty building. Well, first of all, you get your blueprint and David gives us that. Then you build a thing of stones. So we have these walls of the temple made of stones and we have the apartments made outside. So here's a wall and it's made of stones. And these stones that, are, that the wall is made out of. So you have the stone house. Now you're going to make it look pretty. So the next thing you do is you put cedar beams all over this wall. And that's the next thing that's described is the cedar beams that are put over it. And then you carve in this wood, or maybe before you put the beams up, you carve them, or the, the wall up, you carve them. You carve all your decorations in it, and then you lay gold all over it, gold filigree or something to make it look nice. And now the house is finished, but it's empty. And so the next thing you do is you make all the furniture, and you move all the furniture in, you see. And those are the stages by which you do it, and that's the stages in which the chapter is written. That's what accounts for the order of presentation here, and if there's something beyond that in the way of structuring of the passage, I haven't been able to figure it out. Very briefly, let's survey it to make a few comments to help you think about it as you listen to this tape over and over again <laughs> and try to digest this mass of material. But there are discourse markers in the passage. Chapter 6, it says it came about in the 480th year after the sons of Israel came out of the land of Egypt. So this is connected to the Exodus. This is the climax of the Exodus here. The whole point of the Exodus was to get to Jerusalem and build a temple so the ark could be housed in a permanent dwelling and not in a tent. And we've finally gotten there 480 years later. In the fourth year of Solomon's reign over Israel, in the month of Ziv, which is the second month, he began to build the house of Yahweh. So he begins to build it, and we get down to verse 14, it says, So Solomon built the house and finished it. Well, what he built was the stone structure. So that's a discourse marker. We've come to an end of something. Now he puts all the cedar and the gold inside the house all along the walls and makes it look nice, and he finishes that in chapter 7 verse 37 to 38 in the fourth year the foundation of the house of Yahweh was laid in the month of Zev in the eleventh year in the month of Bul which is the eighth month the house was finished throughout all its parts and according to its plans and he was seven years building it so that's that the house is done but it's not ready yet because the furniture hasn't been made but we have another closure there you see and Solomon's palace is built and it's finished in chapter 12 obviously come to an end of the paragraph there. Then in verse 13, Solomon sent, it's chapter 7, verse 13, Solomon brought Hiram from Tyre, and this is not King Hiram, but Hiram the worker, Hiram the builder. And he makes all the bronze things, and that takes us down to verse 47, which is the end of the closure statement. Hiram made everything, and Solomon didn't lay it. Then verse 48, Another section starts, Solomon made all the furniture that was in the house, the golden stuff. We're told Hiram made the bronze stuff, and Solomon made the gold stuff. doesn't mean he made it himself, it means he supervised it. And then there's closure at the end of that in verse 51. All the work that King Solomon performed in the house of the Lord was finished. And he brought all these things inside the house, and then we have the dedication. So that gives us the large outline and sections of this passage into which we can look in detail if we want to stay here all day.
but we don't. Very quickly then, in your diagrams you see the first section here, the structure that's actually built, its dimensions are twice that of the tabernacle, which means that its volume is eight times as great. In other words, we're talking about three-dimensional objects here. So if you go from 10 by 10 by 10, which is a thousand cubic cubits, to 20 by 20 by 20, that's 8,000 cubic cubits. So the, the rooms are actually eight times as large because the dimensions are double. You, they're squared and then cubed, and that's what you're going to get. The ceiling is actually higher, even higher than that. It's 30 cubits high, and except when you go into the holy place, the ceiling comes down because there's these upper chambers there. And the throne is in the cube, and then there are these chambers over it. And this section here describes the house itself and the porch, which is not really part of the house, but leads up to it, and then the side chambers that we talked about. And they're all described in this section, just how they're built. Uh-huh. Do you know how long the cubit was? I remember the cubit, 18 yeah, 18 to 20 inches. And we can pretty much know this. Ezekiel's temple is made of cubits that are sacred cubits, which consists of a cubit and a span. So all the dimensions in Ezekiel's temple are bigger than the dimensions in this temple. But Chronicles tells us, and Chronicles, you see, is written after the exile when the sacred cubit has come in for Ezekiel's temple, which is bigger. Chronicles says the temple is made according to the old cubit, which is this length here. 18 to 20 inches, depending on how big the Hebrews were. <laughs> but I've seen it 20 inches, I've seen it 18 inches. Does it say cubit is in our way? The cubit is known throughout the ancient world to be from tip of your so fingers to your elbow. Exactly where, but no. Yeah. yeah. And Ezekiel's temple, you see, is the new cubit or sacred cubit. It's bigger. But Chronicles says, and I don't remember the verse, you'd have to look it up in Second Chronicles. Well, I might as well find it here since, since we discussed it. It shouldn't take but a second. The temple section is Second Chronicles 3 and 4. And Second Chronicles 3, verse 3 says, These are the foundations of Solomon laid for building the house of God, the length and cubits according to the old standard, the 60 cubits. This is your normal cubit. So it really was double or eight times the size of the tabernacle because the cubit has remained constant. At the end of this section we have inserted here, and this is one of those questions, why is this in the text here and I don't know the answer. The Lord appears to Solomon and gives him this vision, or words anyway, and says, concerning the house that you're building, if you walk in my statutes and execute my ordinances and guard my commandments by walking in them, I will carry out my word with you which I spoke to David my father and I will dwell among the sons of Israel and will not forsake my people Israel. Now, my guess is that that statement is put here because up to now the temple is an empty shell. But as soon as you start putting all this gold stuff in it, that represents God coming into the temple. And so at this point, now that the empty shell has been made, God says, if you're faithful, I'll dwell in here. And then the next thing we read is wood and gold and furniture are brought in. And those things represent God's presence inside there because they're shining and glorious. Now let me give you a piece of evidence for that. Nebuchadnezzar, we've already read, took all this stuff out of the temple and he took it back to Babylon. And the book of Daniel starts off by telling us that all this stuff is there. And what happens in Babylon? Well, God has been brought by Nebuchadnezzar over to Babylon. What happened when the Philistines brought the ark and put it in Dagon's temple? Dagon was defeated. And the book of Daniel is just another version of that same story. Nebuchadnezzar brings all his furniture back, and the next thing that happens is God starts to go to war with Nebuchadnezzar and gives him this dream and says, you're going to be cut down. And finally makes him eat grass for seven years. And then Belshazzar fools around with his stuff, and God goes to war with him, and Belshazzar is defeated. You see what's happening here? It's the same as Dagon falling down before the ark. Only all this gold stuff is taken out of the temple and it's taken over to Babylon and it goes to war. The Babylonians defeats Nebuchadnezzar and Cyrus says, you can take that stuff back. He doesn't give him any gold and emeralds or mice, but 
they bring it all back. You see, it's the same story. And so I think that the reason this is here is it implies what the rest of the Bible makes clearer that all the gold and the wood and all the accoutrements that are put in from here on, those represent God's presence in the temple. And the climax of that is that the cloud comes and fills the temple in chapter 8. So now we have what I have called here the glorification of the temple structure, section B. We could call that the beginning of the symbolic entrance of God in. We have a wood overlay on the stones and garden motifs and flowers and gourds and all these garden things that are put in here. Remember that the Song of Solomon takes place in a garden, a paradise. And so this is it. This is that garden paradise. It's built on the threshing floor, the threshing floor of Ornan. That's where Ruth came to meet Boaz, was on the threshing floor. This is all garden, marriage, Song of Solomon stuff the temple is connected with. The first section focuses on the holy place. Then there's a focus on the holy of holies in verses 19 to 22. The cherubim are described, and there's a big emphasis on the cherubim here, guarding the holiness and surrounding the inside of the house. It's a contrast with Ezekiel, Ezekiel's temple. We already know about the cherubim from Ezekiel 1. And nothing said about them much in the temple that's built itself. We know they're there. We have floors of gold. That's something new. The priests walked on dirt in the tabernacle, and now they walk on gold. They're really in heaven. The Eastern Church has these icons, and if you look at the icons of the Eastern Church, the sky behind the figures is always gold. That's because they're in heaven. And they believe that in heaven the sky is gold instead of blue, and they get that from this. If you're inside this temple, the ceiling and the floor and everything is gold. So in heaven, the sky is gold, and that's the way they draw the icons. I'm not in favor of icons, but that's where that comes from. Uh huh. Yeah, I think so. The whole city is a temple, and so the pavements go. We have floor of gold. We have doors are described. My paper, From Glory to Glory, Degrees of Value in the Sanctuary out there, talks about these doors. The most holy doors are made of olive wood. They're permeated with olive oil, so they're the most holy. Now, the less holy wood is cedar, and the least holy wood is cypress. The cypress is on the floor underneath the gold. The cedar is on the walls. The cherubim are made of olive and the doors leading into the most holy place are made of olive. And then we're told about how they're carved, and we're told about the inner court. Now, look at that. Next section here, Solomon's Palace is described next. Nobody knows exactly what all these houses were, like the house of the forest of Lebanon. Nobody knows exactly what it was or what it was for, but it's all mentioned here. A couple of things we can say is the fact that Solomon's Palace is described in connection with the temple means it's part of the temple king is the servant of the temple and his palace of bronze and cedar is part of the temple courtyard so he's the servant of the temple and that establishes who's in charge who's the high king and who's the vice king who's seated on the right hand side also in terms of the literary structure here Solomon's palace the description of it is bracketed by the statements about the inner court of the temple and the porch which is in 626 we end up by saying that he built the inner court with three rows of cut stones and a row of cedar beams. And we end up the palace section in verse 12 with the same kind of reference. The great court all around the palace had three rows of cut stone and a row of cedar beams, same as the inner court of the house of the Lord and the porch of the house. So that there's a replication of the court features of the house in the palace of the king, which means the palace of the king is part of the court of the Lord. And that's important, as we said yesterday, the theology of kingship is a king always has to recognize Yahweh as supreme king and do what he says. And his palace is part of the furniture of the temple, as ours should be as well. The next section deals with Hiram the Builder. Hiram the Builder works in bronze. We have mentioned about Hiram. He's said to be from Naphtali here. A chronicle says he's from Dan. I guess probably he's somehow from both. By this time, there's been a lot of marriage between the tribes. I sure didn't try to study that out for this lecture, this survey. He builds the pillars. He builds the bronze ocean. And he builds these water stands, which are so complicated. But they are a very elaborate picture of the house of God, one that the people could look at. 
And since they couldn't see what was inside the house, these things were put outside the house for them to look at, and that would give them some idea of what the house itself meant. The water stands are decorated with cherubims and lions and oxen and palm trees. They have hands and they have shoulders. They have feet. They're a chariot. They're very similar to what Ezekiel sees when he sees the cherubim of fire. In Ezekiel 1, here are chariots of water. And they run between heaven and earth by the way they're positioned. And then we have a summary of what Hiram did in chapter 7, 40 to 47. And the focus, as I mentioned, is on those pillars. Because that's what's new here. Of all the glorification that's taking place, the most important thing for the author of Kings is that you understand the king. Because this book has to do with the king, and the king has got to listen to the prophet. If the king doesn't listen to the ambassador of the high king, he's in trouble. He needs to recognize the prophet as his father. When the kings go bad, you've got Elijah and Elisha. I mean, what do you think of when you think of the book of Kings? You think about this big story of Elijah and Elisha in the middle. But that's what they're doing is they are making manifest the presence of the true king because the human kings have gone bad. But the book concerns kings, Yahweh's kingship and the kingship of the vicegerent. And symbolically that's laid out here in these two palaces. I should have mentioned this sometime before now, <laughs> but the word for palace and temple in Hebrew is the same. When you read about Solomon's palace and you read about Solomon's temple, we make that distinction in English, but not in Hebrew. The word is the same word. The palace of the king and the palace of the great king. So they're linked. Solomon, in this last paragraph here, does the work in gold. There's interesting stuff here. It says he made an altar of gold, a table of gold. Apparently the older golden altar and, and table must have been run down. He at least repaired them, maybe made new ones, maybe took the gold off of them, melted it down and made new ones so that there was continuity. We're not told. He made a golden altar and he made a golden table for the showbread. There was still just one gold altar and one table of showbread. We're not told here about the ten other tables that would have had utensils. We're not told... But we are told about ten lampstands that he made and where he put them. The lampstands were of pure gold. The lampstand paraphernalia is said to be made of pure gold. The flowers, lamps, and tongs. No, they are made of gold, regular gold. Verse 50 says, The cups and snuffers and bowls and spoons and fire pans of the golden altar were made of pure gold. And then the hinges of the doors were made of plain old gold. Again, there are degrees of value here. Some things seem to be holier than others. That's a big question we don't want to go into, but I'm just giving you an outline that says it's finished. The next chapter is the Feast of Dedication. The temple is filled by God, which is the ultimate glorification of all these things. Remember, it's all this golden. When God comes in there with His light, it all shines. And if it gets hot enough, it would start to glow itself. But it all shines. And it says in verse 10, The priest came into the holy place. The cloud filled the house of the Lord. And the priest had to leave because it was too hot. It was too glorious for them to stay. Solomon addresses the people. Solomon prays to God. And the people have this tremendous celebration. And the house is dedicated. And then the last thing in this section of Kings is God comes to Solomon and says, Okay, it's built. And if you'll do right, it'll stay here. If you do wrong, it'll be torn down. And he does wrong, and it's torn down immediately. Solomon messes up the people house by putting them into forced labor, and the people house is torn apart. As soon as Solomon dies, Jeroboam takes off half the people. Um, he takes off ten tribes and only leaves two tribes for the house of David, and God does that. God rips it apart. Death is to be ripped in half, right? Ripped in half and devoured by the birds. Now, God keeps the birds away, but He rips them in half. He rips the kingdom in half and tears it up. And immediately, Shishak of Egypt comes and takes all the gold out of the temple. And so, immediately, the house is ruined because the people house is ruined. And of course, over the years, Josiah and Zedekiah and others get a lot of the gold back in, and Nebuchadnezzar takes that. But, you know, this temple is glorious for only a few years before Shishak comes and takes it all away because the people sinned against God and the, the glory starts to depart. Well, that is the conclusion of my remarks on the temple and I can take questions for a little while because I have studied it, but I'm sure I can't answer them all. Go ahead, John. This text in 2 Peter 3 uh, which talks about uh, the Lord coming like a thief 
and uh, heaven is set forth in this period. And then it says the elements. I think the King James says melt with fervent heat and then they were destroyed by fire. What you just said about God inhabiting the well, everything shines, and if it was hot enough, it would glow. I wonder some sort of reference there. Gold is an element, it's base metal. I'm not base metal, it's, a, it's one of the one of the basic elements of you know, chemistry. I wonder is there some reference there to the to the uh, liquidation, the meltdown of the temple, literally, I mean, in a, almost in a well. There might be some allusion there, but I think that the word elements here, and I'm going to ask Peter to comment on this if he wants to correct me. I think it, it would connect with the elementary things of the world, so it's really the idea that the features of the Old Covenant, if this has to do with eighty seventy, 70, are melted away. But I think that the heat of God, the fire of God, is, is pointed there, and you are... Yeah, I think it is the same word for elementary principles elsewhere, but it, I seem to remember that uh, the Greek word was sometimes used to describe the instruments of the temple. So it could refer to the instruments of the temple. It would be, uh, it would be translation of Kali, I think. Okay. So, yeah, there is a connection, perhaps fairly specific if you look up the word elements to see how it is. that the ancients understood the, you know, the elemental chart, but the uh, table of elements, but they, you know, no coincidence that everything is used. I mean, talking about these elemental metals. Uh huh. Did you have your hand up for something? The silver lampstands. I didn't see that described. It's here. not. It's not mentioning King size. And it's Chronicles that tells us about that. Oh, it's Chronicles. Uh -huh. Chronicles has a somewhat different description of the temple with a different order, but I figured this would go long enough. <laughs> but it's really that section I read from David. David talks about how he gave the plans for all this and. Second Chronicles really doesn't talk about building all those silver things. We just assume that they were built. It seems like at the end when Jehoiakim is taken to with Nebuchadnezzar to Babylon, that it mentions that the gold that Solomon put in there is taken out. Yeah. It seems somewhat contradictory to Shishak taking it all out. Yeah, well, Shishak must not have gotten it all, I guess. It's probably not okay. Okay. He sure got a lot of it, and then that's the beginning of that, you know. The first book coming of this branch. Would that have been a part of the repairs of the temple? Yeah, there's the 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 yeah, yeah. He says Solomon. The, the text says Solomon. Yeah, well, he Solomon himself. Yeah, he could be talking about the children. It could be. It could be. Just like the okay. Yeah. Can you make anything out of the years it took to build the temple and the years it took to build Solomon's palace? Well, I don't think I would make out of it what most people would make out of it, which would tend to be that Solomon put more attention to his palace and to the temple. The 13 years during which Solomon built his palace are the same years that Hiram is building these pillars in the Bronze Sea, and Solomon is building all this gold furniture for the tabernacle, and probably the, I mean, the temple, and probably all the silver stuff that we talked about. And so it's not that more attention is given to Solomon's dwelling center of the temple. It's that at the same time, and this gets back to what I was saying before, at the same time, all this bronze stuff for the courtyard of the temple is being made by Hiram, at the same time Solomon's palace is being built, so they're equivalent, you see. And it takes longer to make them just because they're more complicated. What does emerge is God holds off moving into his palace until Solomon is ready to move into his. And so that it's as if God himself decides to exercise patience until his son is ready and then they'll enter into their houses at the same time. And I think that also is, has something to do with redemptive history in the way of prophecy. Nicky? Can you summarize just a few minutes to the Indian temple and the whole land of Ezekiel? No. No. <laughs> <laughs> I think that Ezekiel, Ezekiel's temple is a picture of the restoration from exile, not of the new covenant. I think that the order of things in this prophecy of Ezekiel is that the people will come back into the land in chapter 34 and be replanted. Then he says that there is a great attack upon Israel, Gog and Magog, which I think is the book of Esther. I think that the, the, the relationship between Haman the Agagite and people being buried at Hamon Gog in Ezekiel 38 and 39 is too close and I think there are a lot of other reasons to, to link them up. 
It says in Esther that the people did not lay their hands on the spoil, which meant they were regarded as holy war spoils, which meant they were sent back to beautify the temple. So the idea that you defeat the enemy, the Amalekite in particular, because these are Amalekites, the pattern is in Exodus, you come out of Egypt, the Amalekites attack you, and the Amalekites are defeated, and then the tabernacle is built. In David and Saul's day, they escape from the Philistines, they come out of Egypt, they have to fight the Amalekites, and Saul doesn't, so this is suspended. We wander from the wilderness for 40 years, and then David does defeat the Amalekites, and then the temple can be built. And I think what happens in the restoration is the same. You come back from exile, and in the book of Esther, you have the Amalekite attack from Haman the Agagite. I think that's Gog and Magog. You defeat the Amalekites, and then the temple is glorified. And so I think that the Ezekiel temple is a picture of the Restoration Covenant, but it's too ideal to be built. And so I think one reason that the old guys cried when Zerubbabel built the temple is because they thought Ezekiel's temple was really going to be built. And what actually got built was nothing like it. But it couldn't be built, obviously. I think that there are no two pillars in that temple because there's no longer a Davidic king operating. There's nothing about pillars Yachin and Boaz in the Ezekiel temple. In fact, in Zechariah's visions, the kingly crown is put on Joshua and then the high priests seem to be the actual governors of Israel under the world emperor during this stage in history. I think that the altar receives focus because the Ark of the Covenant is gone. They didn't get the ark back and they didn't make another one. But the top of the altar is almost equivalent in holiness to the most holy place in Ezekiel's temple. If you'd have gone into Ezekiel's temple, there was nothing in the most holy place. There was no ark. All that stuff was gone and they didn't get another one. It was an empty room when Pontius Pilate went in there. He was amazed. All these people had died to prevent him from going in and he finally got in because his room's empty. <laughs> so what happens then then is that the altar receives greater prominence and I think that begins to point us toward Christ and his sacrifice and the prominence of the altar there. The doorways, the open access, that is emphasized tremendously. If you look at your diagram in your book, you see these little guard rooms in these doorway passages. So the emphasis on guarding the doors is tremendously emphasized there. And yet, they're big doors. People can come through. If, if you're okay, you're welcome. If you're not okay, We've got all these guards stationed here in these guard rooms to keep you from going in. And that again goes back to the earlier part of Ezekiel where Ezekiel bores through these walls and sees this defilements in all the walls. The walls all have leprosy in the temple in Ezekiel 8. And Ezekiel keeps getting inside the wall and seeing all these corruptions in the wall. And the walls are torn down because they're no good anymore. So the walls and the doorways and guarding those doorways is prominent in Ezekiel's temple. Of course, that's a message for us. And then the bronze sea, I maintain that this water becomes kind of a ladder to heaven where there's a stream flowing from God out to the altar. Remember, those labors are positioned that way. And I think that's just extended in Ezekiel because this river flows out to the Dead Sea. It doesn't go to the four corners of the earth. It only goes out to the edge of the land. So I think we're still in the Old Covenant Israel context. But it does flow farther out and trees flow all along it so that the principles of the temple, those palm trees that are inside the temple start growing up all along the way so that the temple influences are going out. So I think that's a lot of what's going on. And there are other features to it like the division of the land and the place of the prince and all that. But the people who say that represents a new covenant, how does that differ? And does the return to the captivity foreshadow the new covenant? Yeah. I think each one of these new things that foreshadows the new covenant and the return from the land in an even greater way foreshadows the new covenant. But I think the first application of Ezekiel's temple is to the restoration period because the water only goes out to the edge of the land and things like that. I think that there are aspects of Ezekiel's vision that probably could and should be taken literally. That there are some things that he prescribes like what the prince is supposed to do, how much tithe and tax should be paid, what the Levites were supposed to do with the sacrifices, those things could actually have been put into, you know, those are practical things that, that could have been done in Zerubbabel's actual temple.
but you know the architecture of it is impossible to build literally. You have to take it symbolically. You shouldn't use to teach I would use it to teach postmillennialism, but I would say this just shows how much the kingdom flowed out even before Jesus came. Yeah, I think that one of the things that happens in the Restoration Covenant is that you get this big anticipation of the New Covenant. One of the ways is that there's no idolatry. When Jesus comes on the scene and starts dealing with the Pharisees, they're not worshiping Baal. And the Jews have already gone out throughout all the world and built synagogues. So there's a whole lot of anticipations that have already come into place. And I haven't done much research on this, but I think that you begin to see this happening generally in the world. In Greek culture and in some of the other cultures, there's a breakdown of traditional paganism so that when the gospel comes on the scene, some of the old covenant features have already started to give way to what we would think of as new covenant features. The old idolatry where you try to imitate the animals and be like an animal, be like the wolf, be like the lion. In all your pagan religions, men try to be like animals. But once Christianity comes in, all our stories... Animals were like people. I mean, not just Walt Disney, but all of our animal stories, animals behave like people. Well, in paganism, people try to behave like animals. That's a distinctive change, you know, that comes in, but you, you almost see that being anticipated with Aesop's fables and things in Greece where that doesn't resemble paganism. Instead of drinking the wolf's blood and eating the wolf's heart and doing the wolf dance and trying to turn into a wolf, now we have stories about animals that are just symbols for people. And that's really a new covenant idea where you're moving out from the animal symbols into a more humaniform symbols. So I think that the Restoration Covenant is very anticipatory. But see, I would go to the New Jerusalem and say in Hebrews 12, we have already come to the New Jerusalem and the rivers flow down four sides to the entire edge of the world there. And so that's an even greater symbol. It goes beyond what's in Ezekiel 47. Also, see, the Gentile mission, I think, is hinted at in Ezekiel 47 when it says it goes to the sea and their fish. And there again, you see the Jews go out and they make a lot of Gentile converts in the years before Christ. There are these god fears all around. Yeah. No, I don't think so. That again follows on Moses and Joshua divide the land up among the tribes. We didn't look at this, but Solomon redivides the land. And these administrative districts that are listed here are not the same as tribes. And so he draws different boundaries when the temple covenant comes in. And then you get to Ezekiel and you get a new covenant, you get a new temple, and you get a new districting of the land. So that's part of the new covenant making process. In the uh, restoration temple, the ark did not come back. Did the land stand in the... Well, apparently in Herod's temple they had those things, so they, they must have understood they had permission to make new ones, or they came back. But we know the ark didn't come back. When Shishak stuff out, did he take those as well? The, uh, you know, did they make new ones? I'll just have to look and see what it says Shishak took. He took away treasures, the treasures of the Lord's house and the treasures of the king's house. He took everything, even the shields of gold that Solomon had made and the shields of bronze were made so that the shields are what the tensions called. But he must have taken. He probably did take those things. And they probably did have to save up money and make new ones. So they had a yeah. period of time where they didn't have uh, the temple wasn't functioning uh, while they were making new ones. Could have been because that would have been a problem. We're not told. Yes, sir. There aren't any rooms above the holy place. The temple is 30 cubits high. But the most holy place has got rooms above it. But this room itself is open all the way to the top. The, the ones over the most holy place, what about them? Are they attached or are they like the other rooms around the side? They may well have been completely sealed off and empty. My guess is they were. My guess is that they were empty rooms with no way into them because I think what they represented was heaven. So that they're the chambers that God has. And to get to those rooms, you'd have to go through here and nobody could go through here. That's my guess. Uh huh. Well, it talks about the inner rooms 
over the Holy of Holies. And that's all it says. It doesn't say what they were for or anything. I'm just looking at the symbolism, and that's my educated guess on it, why they were there and what their symbolic purpose was. Yeah, I, my guess is that's what Jesus refers to when he says that in the highest heavens are chambers that wait for us so that we're positioned around the throne of God. This always represents a three-dimensional structure. So when the cloud appears, you've got cherubim on all six sides forming a cube. But to replicate that, we have them on two sides in the tabernacle and we have them on four sides in the temple and in Ezekiel's vision, but ultimately they're on all six sides. It seems like that's the picture here, the whole cloud completely surrounding. I've sometimes wondered if Isaiah's vision in chapter 6 with the seraphim didn't form a sacred cube in the air, but I don't know for sure. Well, it's been fun, folks. Let's close in prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you that we live in the new covenant and that we have full access to you. We can come into your presence in a way, understanding in a way that people couldn't in the Old Testament, that we can draw in worship of you and have full knowledge that nothing awaits our nearness to you except the resurrection. We ask that you give us a greater appreciation of these things. Father, most of us are fairly tired, and we ask your blessing on us as we travel, as we go our separate ways, take care of us, and bring us safely to our homes. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.